Let's review Cushing's disease slash syndrome. This occurs because we have excessive levels of cortisol in the body. Now, how can you remember that? Well, let the name of the disease process help you. We're talking about Cushing's, which starts with C. So we're talking about cortisol. Our cortisol is high. High is also found in the word Cushing's. When you put that together, we get high cortisol. So what is cortisol? Well, this is a hormone that is secreted by our adrenal glands, particularly the adrenal cortex. And your adrenal glands sat on top of your kidneys. They're these cute little cone-shaped structures. So that's where this substance comes from. Now, cortisol is considered a stress hormone. So it helps us deal with stress. Now this hormone is actually great for us whenever we have it in small doses for a short period of time because during those stressful situations, it's gonna help us process fats and proteins, elevate our glucose, increase hunger, which all of that together is going to give us more energy and if we have some type of like tissue trauma, it can help us deal with that tissue repair process. It's going to affect our mood so we have more focus and alertness, regulate the blood pressure so you have better cardiac output, and it's gonna have anti-inflammatory properties so we can suppress that immune system so it's not going all haywire during this stressful situation. But whenever we have excessive amounts of cortisol for too long in the body, what happens is that these processes become faulty. For example, instead of processing fats and proteins like they should, they're going to start having these classic signs and symptoms in their appearance. One thing is they're gonna have muscle wasting where their extremities are going to start to become thin looking, but centrally through like truncal obesity, they're gonna start distributing fat in their face and on their back and their abdomen. Their glucose will be extremely high. They can have hyperglycemia and this is because High cortisol enhances a process called gluconeogenesis, which causes our liver to use things other than carbohydrates to actually increase the glucose. Plus, instead of having focus and alertness, it will start to turn into anxiety and depression. Their blood pressure can be high with hypertension, and that's because cortisol can actually mimic the role of aldosterone. And remember, we talked about aldosterone in our fluid and electrolyte videos, and aldosterone is secreted within our kidneys, and that causes our kidneys to retain sodium and water. So whenever we're doing that, we're gonna be increasing that um, blood pressure. However, potassium, we're unfortunately gonna be wasting that. So they can also experience hypokalemia. And because of this anti-inflammatory properties, what can happen in Cushing's is that they can have slow wound healing and they can be at risk for infections because we're really suppressing that immune system. So now let's talk about how cortisol is produced. How do we even get this substance in our body? Because understanding this is gonna help you understand the difference between Cushing syndrome and Cushing disease and why certain lab work is ordered on these patients. And it all starts with these structures here, the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal glands, and this handy dandy little feedback loop that has been installed in your body. So the very first step that we have is the person experiences some type of stress. The brain picks this up and says, oh, we got something stressful going on. We gotta get our stress hormone cortisol made. So it goes through these processes to do this. Inside the brain, we have the hypothalamus. It responds and it's going to release a substance known as CRH. This is corticotropin releasing hormone. And look at this little prefix in that word right there. Hey, it looks a little like cortisol, doesn't it? So this is one of those precursors to cortisol. So whenever this substance is in the body, it's going to stimulate another structure, which is just a little bit below the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland particularly the anterior part of the pituitary gland to release its own substance known as ACTH. Once you remember ACTH, put it in your mind because it's one of those important labs that may be drawn on your patient. And it stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone. And again, look at the prefix of this word. It's adreno. We know it's talking about the adrenal gland. So this is the substance that's just gonna act on the adrenal glands. So once we have that, we get those adrenal glands stimulated. And once they pick that up, particularly that cortex part in there, it's going to release cortisol. So we have cortisol there to help us deal with the first step of what happened, the stress that this person is experiencing. So we have our cortisol. Typically it should be in small dose for a short period of time. The body picks that up, says, okay, 
we're good. We have enough cortisol. So this feedback loop sends that information up here to our hypothalamus. It says, okay, so I'm going to quit my production of CRH, which in turn will cause the pituitary gland to quit its production of ACTH. And then once it's needed again, this whole system will kick back in. And normally it should work beautifully together. However, this is not always the case. Unfortunately, in this feedback loop, we can have some faulty structures. For example, the pituitary gland can have tumors that's causing it to release way too much ACTH. If we have too much ACTH, that is going to cause our adrenal glands to just pump out that cortisol. So whenever you look at blood work, you're gonna have high ACTH and high cortisol. Now that tells you it's coming from the pituitary gland and that occurs in Cushing's disease. So Cushing's disease involves typically, usually pituitary gland tumors. Now on the flip side, we could have a properly working pituitary gland, but the problem is with our adrenal glands. They have tumors that's causing it to just secrete too much cortisol, or the patient is overusing corticosteroids for a long period of time. Therefore, that is found in Cushing syndrome. And whenever that happens with lab work, typically what you're gonna see is that you're going to have high cortisol, but low ACTH. And the reason for that is because the body senses, hey, we have too much cortisol in the body. So we're gonna shut these down, particularly the pituitary gland from releasing this ACTH, so it drops it. But the adrenal glands are like, I don't care. There's a tumor here causing me to release all this cortisol or this overuse of corticosteroids has caused it. So it just keeps releasing it and not really paying atten attention to this feedback loop. Now let's review the signs and symptoms of Cushing's. And I really want you to pay attention to this part of the lecture because for nursing exams, they love to ask about the signs and symptoms of Cushing's. And to help us remember that material, let's remember a mnemonic I created called stress because this body is completely stressed out. First is S for skin fragile. The person's going to have thinning skin and this is because there's too much cortisol that's altering protein metabolism. And there's a structural protein that's gonna be affected called collagen. So because collagen is affected, it's going to cause the skin to lose its tightness and its resilience. In addition, fat metabolism is affected where it alters sub-Q fat distribution so that skin is more fragile. Plus, the skin can tear and you're gonna notice that the skin takes a long time to heal and that's because our immune system is suppressed. Then there's truncal obesity. This is because too much cortisol affects how the body processes and stores fats along with the appetite and glucose management. This is going to cause the patient to gain weight and fat is going to accumulate in the central parts of the body like the trunk, hence on the abdomen and upper back. This leads to the term buffalo hump where you have the fat on the back or a moon face where the fat is in the face. However, the extremities will be thin and this is due to an alteration in protein metabolism causing muscle wasting. Then there's reproductive issues where the person may not have periods anymore or irregular cycles. They may have infertility problems or erectile dysfunction. This is because there's gonna be an alteration in how these glands release hormones like estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, luteinizing hormone, or FSH. E is for elevated blood pressure. Cortisol plays many roles with blood pressure regulation. One thing like I pointed out at the beginning of the lecture is that it's going to mimic the actions of a hormone called aldosterone. And aldosterone causes those kidneys to retain sodium and water. So we're going to get hypernatremia. But on the flip side, it causes the kidneys to waste potassium. So the patient can experience hypokalemia. So all of that together, particularly with the sodium retention, the water that will increase blood volume, which will increase blood pressure. The patient can also have striae on the abdomen, back, and thighs. These are stretch marks. And this is due to cortisol's effects on collagen production. So the skin isn't as elastic, plus the skin is stretching too rapidly due to fat accumulation. Sugar is also going to be high. We talked about this earlier, hyperglycemia. So you can see polyuria, polydipsia, and because we have high glucose, that can lead to infection. Now, why is this? Well, as I pointed out earlier, cortisol increases blood glucose levels through various ways. And one of those ways was through enhanced gluconeogenesis, which is a very interesting process conducted in the liver where the body actually takes things that aren't naturally made of glucose and turns it into glucose. So the body can have energy. However, the end result is that the body is going to increase the glucose, whether the person needs it or not. And the high cortisol 
cortisol will make the cells actually resistant to insulin. So remember, insulin normally helps cells use glucose that is floating around the blood. But because it's resistant, it's going to cause the cells to not easily take in the glucose from the blood, but will actually leave the glucose in the blood so we get hyperglycemia. Next is E for excessive body hair. This can present as coarse dark hair on the center of the body, like the face, back, chest, and outer parts like the extremities. And this is because of increased secretion of androgens. And then lastly, D for decreased potassium and calcium levels. So we already know why this person can have hypokalemia, but why can they have hypocalcemia? Well, high cortisol levels impair calcium reabsorption within the kidneys. So the kidneys are gonna cause calcium to enter into the filtrate to be excreted out via the urine instead of pulling it back into the blood through reabsorption. So that drops blood levels. In addition, high cortisol levels decrease the person's ability to activate vitamin D. And we learned in our fluid and electrolyte videos that vitamin D plays a huge role in allowing our body to absorb calcium. So we're not activating vitamin D, we ain't getting calcium. And this can lead to bone problems as well in a person with Cushing's. Now let's talk about our role as the nurse. So first up, labs. We wanna be familiar with what that healthcare provider may order on a patient with Cushing's and how we could expect those labs to present in a patient with Cushing's because that's gonna be extremely helpful with those case scenario type questions. So think back to everything we just learned to answer these questions. First up, how do you expect that glucose and sodium level to be? They're going to be high, hyperglycemia and hypernatremia. Now, how do you expect those potassium and calcium levels to be? they're going to be low. So based on that information, you wanna educate the patient, make sure your patient has a diet that's gonna be rich in calcium, in potassium, and they're taking vitamin D, so supplementation or their food. But with their diet, you wanna make sure that they're following a low sodium diet because they're already retaining sodium, so we don't wanna be throwing more in there. And plus, you wanna make sure that they're eating foods that have a low glycemic index because they're already at risk for hyperglycemia. And the next up is a complete blood count, a CBC. You want to definitely pay attention to that whenever it's ordered. And one particular part you wanna look at are those WBCs, the white blood cells. What does that tell you? That tells you about infection. So if these are trending upward, we know that, hey, this person has an infection possibly. So look at that. Plus you want to make sure your patient's not exhibiting signs and symptoms of infection. Do they have a fever, a cough, especially a productive cough? Are they fatigued or do they have slow wound healing? The next, another lab that could be ordered, of course, is a cortisol level. So we know that already in Cushing's where there's their cortisol levels going to be, they're going to be high. So they're going to be high. Normally with cortisol levels, whenever you don't have Cushing's, these levels are going to fluctuate throughout the day. So if you measure a person's cortisol level who doesn't have Cushing's, typically it's gonna be the highest in the morning. And then as the day goes on, when we're approaching midnight, the cortisol levels are gonna be the lowest. But in Cushing's, this level typically does not fluctuate. It's just gonna be elevated. And then lastly, ACTH. So this is a blood test that looks at that. And remember, I told you to remember this because it helps us determine why are cortisol levels high and where this is possibly coming from. So if you have a high ACTH and a high cortisol, where's our problem possibly in that feedback loop? In the pituitary gland, maybe because of a tumor. So we're dealing with Cushing's disease. But if this ACTH is low, but our cortisol is high, it's probably coming from the adrenal glands or from overusage of corticosteroids. So this is Cushing syndrome. Now let's review the medications that can help a person with Cushing. There are steroidogenesis inhibitors, HCTH inhibitors, and glucocorticoid receptor antagonists. So with steroidogenesis inhibitors, look at that name of that category of medications. Genesis is talking about the formation of something. So we're inhibiting the formation of what? Steroid hormone. So whenever we do this, this affects those enzymes that play a role in the creation of cortisol. And one medication is like metabolic. 
And then there's ACTH inhibitors, and this, just like its name says, it inhibits ACTH secretion. So one medication that does that is passeratide. And then lastly is glucocorticoid receptor antagonists, and this group blocks how cortisol can actually work. So it typically helps in cases where we have the hyperglycemia, and one medication that does that is mufoprestone. Now in addition to medications, an alternative treatment could be radiation treatment for the tumors that are causing the high cortisol levels, like in the cases of the pituitary tumors. And then chemotherapy could be used. Now this is um, less common, but I just wanted to mention it. It could be used to possibly shrink tumors that are cancerous. And then surgery could also be performed. So we could have surgery where the pituitary tumors are removed, which will help decrease the ACTH, or the gland can just be removed itself, or the adrenal gland could be removed. So all of it or some. Now, what I want you to take away from this, remember this, is that if we remove, let's say, all of the adrenal gland, you need to educate the patient that they're going to need lifelong replacement of these glucocorticoids, the cortisol. Now, if part of the adrenal gland was removed, they're gonna temporarily need these supplements of the cortisol until the adrenal gland function returns to normal. And they never want to just abruptly stop taking this medication, that they must be tapered off of it because they can enter into adrenal insufficiency where we're talking about like Addison's disease. Okay, so that wraps up this video over Cushing's. And if you'd like to watch more videos in this series, you can access the link in the description below.